Hey y'all, I am James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we have my mother down with us in the, the hey. corner. So yes, um, my, my wife is working tonight and so uh, my mom, the, uh, the, the, the what is your title? Queen mother. Queen mother of the realm <laughs> um, has, uh, has uh, come to join us. So uh, she will be collecting all of the questions okay. tonight. Um, I'll try. Well, yeah, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> so so take it easier on her yes. um so yes, yes and uh, we have the we'll have the official dad joke books um to, for tonight so sorry you won't be getting a mom joke <laughs> so uh tonight we are going to be making the mitered bridal joint uh, and this is the joinery window that we're working on uh, this is nine different joints with six sticks of wood you put them all together and you it's a great way to test your skill and try different joints and, and just play with things um, it used to be that this was a way that a, uh, a cabinet maker would actually test an apprentice and see how the joints because one of the interesting things is you can make each individual joint really nice and clean but if you don't make them really nice and accurate all the way around, when you get to it and your final joint doesn't quite come together because there's a lot of slop other places in the whole piece. This is a really good practice. So we've done the half lap joint. Uh, we've done the standard bridal joint. And tonight we are going to be doing the mitered bridal joint. Um, make sure this is in focus, sorry. Focus, there we go. The mitered bridal joint is a lot like a bridal joint uh, except for it is mitered, as you can see right here. Uh, so on one side, you see the finger, just like you would expect to see on the regular bridal joint. But then on the other side, you don't see it at all. And this is actually fairly common in picture frames uh, and in painting frames, so the, the frame you'd actually stretch the canvas onto. This is one of the, the common ways to do that. So a lot of things are gonna be very similar to how we did the bridal joint, um, but slightly different because we have a miter to put in there. So I'm going to actually go through laying this out and uh, we will head into this. So what we've got here is we've got all the pieces laid out here and I've got the marks on them from previous. So the last time we worked with these two pieces, or first time is that, last time is this, and now we're going to do that on this opposite corner over here. So we're going to take these apart and make sure that they're labeled. The uh, reference side is the tape facing up and here I have the three and three, so that means these will be going together like that. And also I have them laid out so all of the numbers are facing the bottom edge of the window. So it just makes it a little easier to know they will go together like that. So for the layout, uh, any questions on grabbing this? Uh, will the next one be a blind miter bridal joint? <laughs> <laughs> there is such a thing, but no. Okay. Not for this one, although that would be kind of fun. <laughs> I am thinking about doing a, a Japanese joinery um, they do a lot of blind joints. Uh, Japanese joinery is often trying to hide the joinery. Um, so first thing I want to do is I want to lay out the miter. I want to lay out the mark that goes all the way across diagonal on this. And uh, was that super chat? Yes. Bring back Sarah Fund. And Myra Ray's Fund. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, well, thank Alan. you, Alan. So uh, you get the first dad joke. What rhymes with orange? Nothing. No, it doesn't. Oh, <laughs> that was really bad. Uh, welcome to the dad joke. Sorry, you don't get a mom joke tonight. So I could do a couple different things. Number one, I could focus my camera, have it where it needs to be. <laughs> um, I could bring out my mitered square or my unsquare, and I could lay it on here and I could draw that out. And that will give me an exactly 45, which I'm going to do that on this stick. Wait, let me make sure I'm doing this right. I want them to be this way. <laughs> yep, I do want them this side. <laughs> Measure twice, cut once. And we're going to lay that in there. We'll mark this one on here. And then I'm going to flip it over, flip this over, do the same thing on this side. But if you don't have a miter square, don't think you're up a crick without a paddle. You can actually do a few things to figure it out with a regular square. So there's my marks on that one. Then we're going to go on to this one, make sure we're in the same spot. We're going to be at that angle. So what I'm going to do on this one is I'm going to lay one piece right on top of the other. And I'll line these up just, show, just so. 
and then I'm going to put a nick right here on this surface. And while I'm here, I'm actually going to mark the board on top. And then I'm going to reverse these. And I'm going to, let me turn this around so you actually see what I'm doing. I'm going to put Move, make those all really nice. So put a nick on this face. Oop, I just slid. Don't slide. Sliding not good. I put a nick on this face. And now what I've got is this tiny little nick here, and I can draw a line from that tiny little nick to the corner. So I'm going to put my knife in that nick mark. Put this on here, and I'm going to line it up to the other corner. Tw cut twice says the knight that says Nick. <laughs> the knight that says Nick. I like mm -hmm. it. Good. And now, I'll put that on there. Flip it over. Do the same thing on this side. Line it on there. Line it up on the corner. This. I'm trying not to rush this point because this line really, really matters. There we go. So we've got our miter lines on both of these, how they need to go together like that. Now, let me actually go ahead and check it with this just to see. It should be exact. It is. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> but if you don't have a miter square, you don't need it because you have the reality of the other joint. Um, especially if your two pieces are dissimilar thicknesses, so if this was three inches and this was two inches, then your angle wouldn't be 45, it would be something weird. And so you can always put one on top of the other and transfer from one side to the other, then connect those two points and you can make any angle come together. So you don't need to figure out what the angle of that joint is, just use the boards. Uh, so now let's figure out uh, which one of these I want to be the tenon and which one I want to be the mortise. Because in this one, the, the side that's actually the mortise gets cut straight down. Nothing sticks over into this piece. All of the surface is back on this one. Uh, now I could do a, uh, a half lap, what, would be, what is it called? A half lap bridle, no, a half lap mitered bridle joint. Um, in which case the back would extend all the way up. Um, and this side would be mitered, but we're going to make both sides mitered. So for that, we need one of these pieces and we need to cut off that angle. So I'm just going to pick this one at random. It doesn't really matter which one. And put it in the vise. Do you have any questions so far? Not so far. Alan says, though, that the super chats for Myra, the queen mum, is to tell something about James each time. <laughs> this is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I said, I don't think he would like that. <laughs> ah, make it fun. <laughs> <laughs> I've told all about you, though. <laughs> there's not there's not anything else to tell. <laughs> I'm gonna put the line on here to cut down to. Make sure it matches up. Okay, so what we've got on here, back this up a little bit more, is a line. Now the line is at a weird angle, and that really scares a lot of people, especially if it's not 45, it was something else. But with a handsaw, as long as there's a line that you can see and you can get the saw to it, you just cut on the line. So we're going to start here. Let me flip the camera around to this side so you can actually see me pinching it. So on this side, I'm going to be pinching the board and we'll let the saw ride on my thumb. So we'll start over here and I pinch the board because the more I pinch it, the more I can push it over. And the more I release, the more the saw comes back. And so I can adjust where the saw goes side to side by how much I'm pinching the board. And then let it slide on my thumbnail until we establish and then we can cut it straight down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to watch the line on my side of the board. And now it's cut down. I can see the line on my side and I can see the line on the other side. I can take this, flip it over, I have to extend it out just a little bit more because I don't want to run into that. And now I can cut on this side of the board. 
That way I'm always cutting on the side so I can see it. Just like that. Now, <clears throat> this isn't terribly pretty because it was done with a saw. I can get it pretty close, but I have a shooting board set up and I figured, let's go ahead and give the shooting board a try tonight because you don't always get to do that. Any questions while I set that up? Um, question. Um, are double bridle joints a thing? A double bridle joint. Um, I'm assuming a double bridle joint would be three boards coming together, but I don't know what the double would be referring to. If you could imagine it, it's a thing. <laughs> I'm sure someone out there's made it. So with this, I can loosen this up and I can set this to 45, which is right there. And then I need to loosen these up. I can slide this back until it just touches. And then I can put this in and I can shoot this little board. If you haven't seen this, I have several videos on shooting board. This is the this one is the most recent one that's the, the ultimate, ultimate shooting board. So I can set this in here. I'm just going to go right until I hit that line. Maybe just a hair more. One more. I think I'm taking a little bit too much yet, too much on the top. So I need to move the lateral adjuster. Because of the plane, it doesn't matter if the sole is square to the side, it matters if the lateral adjuster is set. And there we go. 45 degrees. Don't need to check it, but we can. And you can see, Dad's happy right there. That's what that is. And we'll probably do a little bit of adjustment later. Okay, an answer to the double bridle joint. What's that? Um, an answer to the double bridle joint. He was thinking, meaning two tenons. Um, two, oh. Or is Aaron, Yeah, you could, if it was Aaron a thicker Finn piece. says like a finger joint. Yeah, like a, like a double tenoned joint. Mm -hmm. Sure. You can do whatever you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> and call it whatever you want to call it. This is the James joint. Okay, now. It's been my life. Oh, I forgot to do that joint marker. I need to mark um, on this one, because this is going to have the tenon. Because on this one, I need to take off. Let me just make sure I'm thinking through this right. Take off that, take off that. And on this one, it's just take off that. Okay, so I don't need the depth stop. That's right. It's like I thought I'm thinking through this right. And I want this marking gauge. So what I'm going to do is I need to make a tenon on the end of this board. And so I'm going to set this up here, grab my marking knife, put my chisel on here, and I'm going to mark out the width of this tenon. I like to mark out and lay it out on the board itself to make sure that my chisel, the mark I'm laying, is exactly the width I want. It makes it a lot easier to set this up. Because rather than trying to set this up to the chisel size and then set the fence on without bumping it, that's just a crazy pain. So I can set one pin into there, set the other pin into there, slide the fence over, and I can reach underneath and tighten it up. And I know now that this is the exact same width as my chisel, and it's also set to the same distance away from my board, and my fence is referencing off the side with the tape. So I can set this on here. And I can mark out on the face and then down this side. And I'm only marking out the two sides. I'm not marking out the other one because this one's mitered. This one's going to create a tenon that then goes into this joint. But I do need to carry this across so I know where to stop at. Put that in there. 
a little nick right there. Drop some tools into mm. the floor. Yeah, it's a good That's thing you're padding. And put this in here. And I'm just going to mark the middle here because this is our mortise side. Then again, with it on the tape side here, we can put this in and mark across. That was another super chat I saw. Yeah, Tom West. He says, yay, windows without glass night. Again, <laughs> who's ready to have some fun? Cheers all. Nice Thanks, Tom. White oak. Here, I'll get you your joke in a moment. <laughs> sorry. Oh, don't be sorry. It's better you than just being here by myself. Okay, I'm glad. Much, much better. <laughs> that way people can talk about me behind my back. Don't don't act like it doesn't happen. I know. <laughs> Go back and read them. It does. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's see what we got. Uh, you have to be careful. Oh yeah, this is a good one. What do you think? If Iron Man and the Silver Sea and the Silver Surfer teamed up, would they be alloys or allies? Oh, that's really poor. <laughs> oh, that is such a groaner. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So this one's going to be the tenon. Let's cut that one first. And the nice thing about this is it's going to be, we're going to cut it just like we cut the other tendons, but we're only cutting half of it. We're not cutting the other half. And so I can put this in here vertical. I'm going to grab, oh shoot. Oh well. I was going to sharpen this. I've said that for the last two times we've been here. My tenon saw is about as dull as it gets. So I have to be more careful with lining it up. But we'll do it. We'll make it happen. This is, this is why I do lives, because you get to see what reality is like in the shop. You don't get to see those perfect videos that everyone else puts out. So this is the tenon, so I want to cut on the outside of the line. So we're going to start back over here, and again I'm pinching the board, letting it slide on my thumbnail. Normally I start on the far side, but because I don't want to cut into that far side, I'm actually going to start back here. And I'm going to slowly raise my hand to cut across. Just not all the way across. Just want to develop a curve line. And now we're going to cut down this face. Down to the stop mark, which I didn't write mark. <laughs> it would be good. To mark the stop mark, put that into the knife line, bring the square up, mark there, yeah. I'm going to cut down to the line here, and then up on top, I'm going to try and connect the dots from corner down to the line. close, but I don't want to get too far. Then we repeat to the second thing on the other side. find yourself veering off the line, don't try to correct it and force it back onto the line. Back up and fix the problem before you get to that point. So bring it up and then use the side of the saw to scratch it back in. Get yourself back on that line. And then continue to cut. There we go. There's one. Now, we're going to do it on this one, but on this one, it's a little bit more funky, and because it comes to a point, it's really hard to start the saw on that point. So I'm actually going to lean it at an angle, and I'm going to cut across the bench. And that'll make this just a little bit easier to actually get going. Sorry if you hear the kids upstairs, apparently the natives fun. are restless. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this one I want to cut on the inside of the line. I'm 
just going to start the saw because I want to have enough space to work on. And now I'm going to flip it back around so that I can watch that line on both sides at the same time. Put it a little lower in the vise. Ooh, I went off the line a little bit. So now that we have this in, make sure to come back in here and correct. Come down an angle, cut on the side I can see the line on. Down to the stop cut. Come back over, wash the line on the other side. And then we cut down to depth. And repeat on this one. This one I have to correct a little bit. There we go. And down the other side. And the nice thing about this is that if you have a bit of a gap on the beveled edge, it's really not much of a problem as long as your miters match because you're not going to be able to see the inside of the joint. So, good, simple thing to fix out. Any questions while I'm setting this up? Um, yes, just got one from Alex. He says, is, is this 12 PPI tenon saw or a different number of teeth? Uh, this is, I thought it had a punch on it. Looks like about 12. Oh no, this is a 14 PPI cross cut. Um, usually for a tenon saw, 12 is about where I'd want it to be. 14 is a little bit fine, but in that butter range. Um, but a carcass saw is a cross cut saw, even though Veritas sells a rip cut carcass saw which just confuses people. Okay, can you explain that to me? What is a 12 PPI? Um, PPI is the number of points per inch. Okay, thank you. Uh, then you have TPI, which is the number of teeth per inch, which should be the same thing, but if you move the scale a little bit, one more point appears, gotcha. it, it, the same amount of teeth. So PPI is one more than TPI. Of course. <laughs> and why not? <laughs> Just to confuse people. Uh -huh. Not that that one ever really matters on a saw. Okay. So the smaller is the... The bigger the number, the smaller the teeth. Okay. The smaller the number, the bigger the teeth. And cross cut is for cutting across the board. Ripping is cutting with the board. Okay. So um, on this one, we've cut down either side. And now... We need to cut down the face and remove these little pieces to actually create the tenon. Doing the same thing here we did before. Except on this one I can't take it over the shooting board. So I'm trying to hit that line dead on. Because I don't want to use a shoulder plane if I don't have to. A little more. Uh -huh. There it goes. Just like that. And before we go any farther, I'm actually going to grab my chisel and I'm going to clean this up a little bit. Okay, so it was well, a little bit bowing in the middle. While you're cleaning that up, Matthew Morrison says, just wanted James to know that based on his video recommendation of for the rubber format, I purchased some from my shop and will, it will be here tomorrow. Ooh, fun day. Yeah. Enjoy that semi-trailer. <laughs> do, do you have help getting it into your shop? <laughs> <laughs> now, let me actually zoom in on this. And focus. Fuzzinesses. There we go. That's much better. 
So I've got that. I'm going to come in here and just cut off that which I just chiseled in, bringing it in to a nice corner. And then I can always grab the chisel, do a little detail. I'd rather do the de detail now because it's in the vise and it's ready to go. And I can set this on here to make sure that we are good. There we go. Now let's flip it over and do the same thing on the other side. Yay! Second verse, same as the first. Ought to get better, but it's not. <laughs> so again, I'm going to stay as close to that line as I can. Someone saying mommy? It sounded like right. <laughs> Am I through? Nope, a little more in the back. There we go. I'm going to come through and do the cleanup on this one. Happy with that tenon. That one looks pretty good. Cut off the excess. Clean it up just a little bit. And there, there's our tenon. Now we need to work on the mortise. So we got to get rid of all of the excess in between the two pieces on here. Okay, question. Since this joint wouldn't be seen anyway, why couldn't you saw the shoulders and just chisel off the waist? Saw the shoulders. Isn't that what I did? I That's sawed the shoulders. What you did. And chiseled off the excess. Um, yeah. Oh, I see what you're saying. Um, just to stay, because um, I'm going close to the line. Yeah, I can saw a little ways away from the line and then chisel the shoulder uh. back to it. Um, that's perfectly fine, um, but I'm a little more comfortable with my saw, so I can hit that line and just go right on it. 99% um, of the time, well, not 75% of the time, it'll be right on it. And I'll err just a little bit off of it if I have to err, err, depending upon who you talk to. Uh. <laughs> and uh, then I'll come back and clean that up with a shoulder plane or a chisel. Um, but. And Matthew says, don't worry, he has a two-year-old daughter that's helping him to unload. <laughs> I said you were you were doing siding at five, so that start them early. Yep, we've got videos at five years old up on the second story. Yep, it's a garage hanging siding. Oops. Yep, I'm in a weird hole. I did lock. There it goes, all the way. So now we're going to chisel this out. And this one's a little bit different because it's on that 45, though it's not much different from what we did last week. Uh, it's basically the same maneuver, just it looks a little bit different. So I'll show this as I focus. So with this, my line is right on that corner. So I'm going to come down a little ways. I'm just going to cut straight in. Because those are small pieces, they pop out. Once I've pop gone in a little ways, I come in this, pop that out. And I can just keep going down. Until I get, I'm gonna go a little past halfway on this one. So reach in, pop out the chunks, chisel down. And make sure to get the chisel stuck so you can't get it out. And you can see I'm staying a lot good ways away from the shoulder on this, that line. I go down to about here. Call it from that. I'm gonna do the rest on the other side. Now I'm gonna go right into that line and clean this thing up. Actually, I'm gonna stay a little ways away from it still. There's that. Now I can go right into that line. And I'm going to eyeball vertical. Just like that. So I've got that baseline. 
cleaned out in there. Now we can flip this over and do the little bit left from the other side. I just want to be more careful with this side because there's nothing supporting it now because it's um, hanging out over the side like that. Turn this a little bit more for that. See if I can turn a little more. Go down! There it goes. That hole's a little bit oily. Staying away from the line, chopping in a little ways. And then this one, rather than going to the end, just going to pair back, chop in again. And there, we're already through. So we've gotten rid of the majority of the waste. Now, go about halfway back towards the line, keep it vertical. About halfway back towards the line again. And then we're going to put it right into that line because I don't think I can get any closer. And I'm going to undercut this one a little bit because I think I was pushing forward. Just like that. Yeah, that looks better. Now, we got a bunch of junk on the inside there. And so there's a couple of ways I can fix that. Number one, I can come in with a regular bench chisel. Oop, let me focus on the right thing. Come on, camera, work for me. That one, focus there, there we go. I can come into this and I can pair out the sides. But sometimes that's not quite as accurate. So I actually like to use a file, put it up into here. And I'm going to grab a file. Any questions while I'm setting this? Um, yeah. Um, anyone, okay, and this is just a general question. Anyone know where to get Ner Narex mortise chisels? They are sold out everywhere online. Yep. Unfortunately, pretty much all hand tools across the board from decent companies are sold out across the line. Um, suppliers just can't get supplies, and there has been an uh. incredible demand this last year. Um, most hand tool makers have been running at like 300%. Of normal um, just because there's been so much demand um, so most of the really common things Veritas is almost all sold out Lee Nielsen has a ton that's sold out um, most manufacturers are having a really hard time keeping things in stock so yeah unfortunately it is hard to get so we're gonna file this out Actually, we'll start with this one because it's a little bit narrower Okay, one other question while you're doing this. Yeah, what we got? Um, um, Alex says, why not just why not just using the vise for this? Is the hold fast that much better for this operation? Um, when chiseling, when pounding down, I like to pound down into the bench rather than pounding down into in between vise because nothing's actually supporting the work. It moves down. It's just a personal picky thing. Um, really doesn't make much of a difference one way or the other though. Um, I, I, I have done and do do quite a bit of um, chiseling in between the vice jaws. So, just want to clean that out. This one is almost exactly the same width as my tenon. And so if I can get this through, the tenon should slide in there nicely. try on. So, yeah, see it's really, really tight. So, I can either file this down, and just make sure, yep, I'm going to work on this a little bit more, or I could change the tenon. And honestly, if I have to pick between a bridle joint and a mortise and tenon. I'll take the mortise and tenon any day because bridle joints just tend to be fairly finicky. So I'm trying to work up here and use it almost as a saw cutting down into it. Since this is almost the exact same thickness as my tenon, it's actually just a hair under my tenon.
but then it keeps sliding down a hair too far and gets wedged. Almost there. Let's give that a try. Oh, still a bit on the fat side. Not by much though, not by much at all. Yeah, it's really, really close. So I just want to see where do I need to take off material? Do I want to take it off of here at all? So I can check for square. Ah, uh, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit off of this. Ooh, don't do that. Don't file your chisels. So I can use the file on the side of the tin in here. These are actually curved tooth floats. Uh, focus on it. And they work, uh, they're curved tooth files. They work like a float. Um, and they just hit the high spots. They don't, uh, uh, they, they, they actually do a very good job of smoothing and flattening surfaces. Okay, that may have just answered the question. What's that? He said, what was the style of that file? It is a funky pattern. Yes, curved tooth file. Okay. Um, I have a couple videos on different types of files where I cover that one in, in depth. That's looking really close. But not quite. So I need to clean up one of these shoulders just a hair. And I believe it's that one. And actually the tenon. Nope, I need to remove a little bit of material off of this right here. I actually can see the line. So that means that I didn't get quite as close to it as I thought I would. So let me show a couple different ways of cleaning it up. Number one, I can grab a shoulder plane. And it's not really my favorite way of doing it, but it does work. Focus. And I want to make sure I go with the grain. So I want to go this way. I do not want to go this way. It'll cause a lot of issues. So with this, I can set it in here and then just take off little bits here. And I want to take off more material over this way. This side? Or was it this side? No, it was this side. And so what this is doing is taking down material right here on the face, but it's not taking down material out here. So for that, I can come in with this and pare it away. Or I could come in with a, chip, with a regular bench plane, now that I've gotten close to the edge of that, and then clean it up with this. Though my general preferred method is to come in, and this is hard to do from this angle. Actually, I'm gonna, ah, I can't do it from that way. Just a second, let me turn around to the other side. Oh, I was on the wrong camera, that's why. <laughs> come around over here is just to do it like this. Because I can use this to reference off of this area. I know this area is good. This area needs to come down just a little bit more. Okay, while you're doing this, Seth asks, is this joint easier or harder with the oak compared to softer woods? Um, it's not it's to do with hardness that's the problem. It's that oak is very, very stringy. Oak has a lot of texture to it. And that, um, that can run into issues. Uh, because there's just a lot of things to chip off and move around on you. So let's give this a try. Oh, see, that fits together a lot better. There. Okay, now we've got a gap on this side, and that is because my vice is too tight. That is because we're tight on this side. So I can look at this, and I realize there's still a little bit of space over here that my plane didn't get all the way down to. So I need to take off a little bit of material here. And I could take that off a bunch of different ways, but I could just take a plane and shave it off. I could come in with a chisel and clean it off, which I think is what I'm going to do, because I like doing chisel work. What questions we got while I set this up? Um, what time are we at? You're oh, 39. Eight. Cool. Yeah. We're actually doing really good. I thought we were later than we are. I'm starting to get sweaty. <laughs> we had to turn air conditioning on. I was like, whoa. Well, it did get up to 80 degrees here today. Yeah, it's way too hot. <laughs> yep, I agree. Okay. So I'm actually just going to come into this, just like it being a plane. And I'm going to pare down 
right to that line. Just take a hair off of there all the way along it, right down to that line. And then we can test it again. Oh, I love that feel. Okay, so we're good and tight here. Good and tight. On this side, we've got a hair of a gap. Can I show it on the camera or not? No. What's that? Okay. Oh, sorry. I thought it was on that camera. Thank you for letting me know. Mm -hmm. She does her job well. Oh, yeah. So we can slide this in here. And I'm really nice and tight along this side. And this side, there's probably uh, 30 seconds or less. Just a hair of a gap there. And so if the gap's on this side, that means that something's hitting on this side. So I need to take off a little more material. And yep, I can still see some gap in there. So let's try a different method. So I can do it with the chisel, which is a very fun route. Or I can use, where did I put that float? That font, there it is. I can use this. I can come in here. And this just takes a little bit off. That 30, se 30 second may actually be a bit too much. Now with this, I want to be careful that I don't round this. I don't start high here and round over there. I want to keep it nice and flat. So I'm actually putting all my pressure is on the finger that's on top of it. I want to make sure I'm just taking it off of this one because this is the one that was touching. Lots of things to make sure of. Let's try that again. It's a little better. Nice and tight there. Actually, yeah, I need to take a little bit off of this shoulder. So I can see what happened here is that this shoulder is actually cut back out rather than undercut. So I'm going to sit in here and put this chisel right under that line. Yes, Melody? <laughs> Not right now, Mel. We'll be up in a little while. <laughs> nope. We'll be up in a little while. Go play, Mel. Okay. <laughs> as much as I tell them, don't come downstairs while we're recording. Okay. Keep the chisel vertical and just chop back to that shoulder line. Actually, I can use a slightly smaller one, not the quarter inch. Let me grab my half inch. And I can just put my body weight into this one. The oak is just a little bit too hard to shave off that much with the one inch. Okay, quick question while What's you're that? doing that. The poor man wants to know, James, do you ever find when comparing these that some areas improve while others stay the same or get slightly worse? Um, if you're talking about comparing joinery windows over the time, yeah. Um, it's not just about, you don't get better in a linear fashion. Um, life is a zigzaggy line. That would make a really good t-shirt. <laughs> That's what you need, some more t-shirts. <laughs> zigzaggy white oak. <laughs> okay. Now that is downright acceptable. I'll take that. So that's where we're going to leave this one. And it looks like that. So if you guys have questions, throw them in the chat. We'll hit a few questions here before we wrap up. we got uh, 45 minutes left. we got plenty of time. There. Got a little bit of a gap here where my file, at least I think it was the file, went a little over time. But I am pretty happy with how out of focus that shot is. There we go. <laughs> there we go. Mitered bridle joint. Looks like a mitered joint there. Looks like a bridle joint there. But no, it's a mitered bridle joint. <laughs> so there we've got, we've got that one. And we've got this one. Oh yeah, here we gotta check. We gotta check and just see how square we are. Because if it's out of square, it's actually out of square here. <laughs> oh, it's just pressure. Nope, that's dead. 
I'll take it. The one time that being dead is a good thing. <laughs> yep, there we go. Square that way, square that way, happiness. And that's the interesting thing about this, this whole project is you can be square on every single joint. And then you put it together and you end up with a gap that looks like that. Ooh. This joint would be square except for these shoulders. Is it this one or this one? One of these two shoulders was just like a 60, probably a 64th or less, a hundredth of an inch difference shoulder length this way to this way. And that just pushed this corner out just a little bit. And that creates that gap. So it's, this really, really teaches absolute accuracy to get those to tighten up and close up. But yeah. Um, got that? Got that? Cool. Uh, next week we will be doing, um, we'll be starting on the inside joints because the very last one to do is actually the splined miter, which will be the thing that brings it all together. So I think next time we're going to do the standard um, mortise and tenon. Not a through mortise and tenon, that'll be later. This be the regular one. Alex says, so now it's time to sharpen that saw. Yes, <laughs> I had it on the list to sharpen and just forgot to do it this afternoon. Um, but I won't have time to sharpen it before next week. So. I wonder why. Yeah. Hmm. Now my wife and I are actually going to uh, Hawaii. Fingers crossed. <laughs> we have we have made plans to go to Hawaii now six times, um, two of which were this last year. Uh, four other times have fallen apart for other reasons, or three other times. This is the sixth time, and so hopefully Thursday we're leaving for it. So it's gonna be fun. Um, what questions we got? Okay, so the duck wants to know where are some places we could find this joint used in the past. Um, it is great for picture frames. Um, you'll see it a lot in um, framed canvases. So you'd wrap the canvas around a frame for painting. That frame is often done with a, uh, with a mitered um, tenon because the, the tenon provides a, a horizontal rigid, rigidity and the frame will then wrap around it. And so that will stop the boards from pulling out in different directions. So you're, you're constrained in every direction. But then the miter also gives you that nice sharp corner that everything is brought to, so you can wrap the frame around it, wrap the fabric around without seeing a line from a shoulder that would be sticking uh, at 90 degrees. So it's, it's very, very useful, um, or you'll see it for that. Um, in furniture, you will sometimes see it on the corner of, um, if you have a glass pane tabletop um, and you have the frame going around it, that's a very common one, and then the glass would be, would be uh, um, mitered into it. And uh, yeah, um, but most often picture frames and things of that nature. Okay, and Seth really does want you to show how to sharpen a 14 TPI Veritas tin and saw. Um, I don't think I need to sharpen this one right now because I just sharpened it not too long ago. That was pretty good. Um, but I do have a video on sharpening uh, 16 PPI dovetail saw. Uh, if you search for wood by right, how to sharpen a dovetail saw, that'll pop up. So even smaller teeth. Um, I haven't done a video on sharpening a 20 PPI yet because I despise 20 PPI dovetail saws. A vengeance. No one needs to go that fine. <laughs> but yeah, definitely take a look at that. If you're ever wondering if I ever made a video on something, um, go to the regular YouTube search or um, uh, Google search. Don't search on my channel because I have two different channels. But if you just go to YouTube and type wood by right and whatever your topic is after that, um, you'll probably come up with like three or four videos that I've made. So now close to 2,000. Actually, I think I'm over 2,000. It's a lot of videos. <laughs> What's next? That was it. That's it? That's it. Wow, short questions. I know. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> I've got a fun one. Speaking of Thursday, uh, my wife and I, you know, we're leaving. So I was recording today's video um, and I've had a few discussions um, with other people about finishes. And so on Thursday, I am going to be going at this wasp nest with the biggest bat I know of and uh, striking it open to the, uh, the question about um, wood finishes going rancid. 
<laughs> so I'm really interested to see those um, discussions because I will be in Hawaii at that time and so I'll be able to relax and, and laugh at people. <laughs> but yes, stay tuned for Thursday. It is going to be a, a fun one. Um, yeah. Okay, we do have a, two other questions that just popped up. Okay. Okay, a one from Sam Wise. In doing canvas frames, would you make two tenons on two boards and two mortises on the other two, or would you make a tenon and mortise on each board? No, you would have the um, you would have the the tenon. Well, traditionally, the tenons would be on the top and bottom rails, um, and then the styles um, would have the the mortises. Um, the reason being is if it's a normal um, landscape picture frame, in other words, wider than it is tall, you would stretch the width first and that would pull the two pieces together. So you'd want the tenons sticking out to grab onto that. And then you would stretch the ends, wrap those around and staple them, and then you would work your way around stretching the whole thing. Um, but that's random tradition. Um, okay, theoretically, Charles, it's better. It doesn't really make a difference. No. Charles McBride says, is there any benefit to putting a peg in that joint? Um. You could. Um, if you're doing it with like a stretched canvas, um, in that point, the canvas actually will keep them from going out. Um, and a lot of canvases, the frames actually aren't glued. They're just, they're held together with the canvas itself. Um, so that if you do take the canvas off, you can disassemble the frame. Um, and that's what would, a lot of painters would do is they disassemble the frame, they would roll up the canvas, transport it, um, and then they'd have the frame in a smaller package so it would be easier to move rather than picture frame, a uh, whole picture. Um, but yeah, you, you guess you could do it. Uh, one of the joints we'll be doing later is actually the drawboard um, tenon. Um, so you actually put a pin, a, a, ten, a, a tenon in to pin, pin <laughs> a pin in the thing. tenon to suck it together. Um, that's one of my favorites uh, because that is designed to go together without glue. Um, so you can actually have a solid joint that is then constrained in every direction. Seth says that a peg might make it an artistic choice too. You could. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing with it, with the with putting a peg in, is that it wouldn't be centered. And so if you would show it to my dad, he would knock you upside the head and say, "Make it centered, you fool!" Um, because it has to be balanced. <laughs> uh, because the center of the joint. It, it, it would be right here. So you would actually have to put the peg over here. Oh, and that would drive him crazy. Um, and so you'd probably have to put a fake peg over here to make it balance out. Uh -huh. um, but I mean, I don't know, there'd be some interesting <laughs> artistic touch to that. It'd be kind of fun. Okay, Matthew Morrison says, I can add an unrelated question in then. Where is the best place to acquire irons for custom molding planes? Is it common to buy blanks? or perhaps to fashion them out of steel myself? Um, either way, um, if you are um, proficient with a, with, a, with a cutter, you can get some um, O1 um, steel or O1, A2, depending upon, there's lots of metallurgy between the two and which one would be better and yeah, whatever. Um, just get some plate steel, um, eighth inch thick and cut it to shape. Um, however, you can buy blanks um, from um, Lee Nielsen, and they make blanks that then come in whatever width you want with a thin tang already cut into them. And I want to say they were like 15 to 20 bucks a piece, but I'm probably way off because I haven't bought one from them in four or five years now. Um, but yeah, they, they're great. You just, you just get the, the width of the blade you want, and then when it comes, it comes annealed, so you can shape it to whatever you want and then grind in your, your bevel on the back. So it comes as just a blank without a bevel, and you can shape it then to make whatever molding you want. And uh, a lot of fun to do. I've got a couple videos on that if you want to see that as well. Is that it? That caught you up. Cool. Well, then I think we'll wrap this one up. And uh, next week, we'll be having some more fun. And uh, yeah, that'll be, yeah, I'll be, I'll be landing at like 8 a.m. that morning, so I might be kind of <laughs> drowsy. Actually, no, next week we are doing a Q&A. Oh, oh, I've got to talk about this. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Good thing we're wrapping up early because I forgot about this. I've got to show off some oh, things. Oh, yeah. So, Aaron, I'm hoping you're in the chat. Aaron um, 
Ben? Yes. Yes, he's in the chat. Ah, uh, Aaron, let me show you. Because next week we are going to have some fun. Um, next week, uh, Aaron actually made these, and we're going to do a Q&A next week. Um, but the whole uh, thing next week will actually be a benefit. Um, all of the Super Chats will be going to the Purple Heart Foundation. And one other thing that I can't talk about yet, you'll know about that on Saturday. Um, and we're going to be having a good bit of fun because Aaron made um, 20 items to be auctioned off. And so we're going to auction off a few of them live next week. And some of these are really, really cool. Like this is a, uh, the mallet that he turned. And you can see in here it has the Wood by Right logo. And so we're going to be auctioning off uh, one of these. And then he also turned um, some pins. And these ones, all of the pins, they come in the cigar shape. Um, and they have the logos in. Absolutely gorgeous. They he did an amazing, amazing job on these. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have a couple that are, uh, are thin line and uh, like that. So next week, we will be doing the Q&A um, and auctioning off uh, two pins, a pin set, and a mallet. Um, and then we'll be kicking off the main auction where we'll be selling off um, all of them. So uh, this will be fun and all of the proceeds go to charity. Aaron actually, he is donating all of his time and all of the, the money that went into this and making these, these resin fills cost a decent amount. Did you, did you um, do a close up of the resin fills? I thought I did. I, did. I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I was looking at the chat. They're just so cool, though. And they all say uh, Knights, the of, Knights the White Oak. of the White Oak. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he did an amazing job on these. And so they'll be going to the Purple Heart Foundation, uh, which, if you don't know, uh, it was set up by uh, Rob Cosman. Um, and it is uh, it's designed to get tools into the hands of veterans who want to learn woodworking. Um, really, really cool cause. And so I'm looking forward to doing the... Uh, uh, that on this. Yeah, all of these have, um, is it Paduke wedge? No, this one's different. This one has an oak wedge. This one has a Paduke wedge. And this one has a Paduke wedge. Um, and just really, really gorgeous. So Knights of the White Oak, you can have a Knights of the White Oak pin. Um, and all of that we'll be doing next week. So stay tuned. Um, anything else before I go? Cool. I think that'll do it. Got it. So uh, go ahead and hit the button. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye, gang. Cool. Well, that was fun.